For more than 80 years, people in the northern and southern states had been debating over the issues of slavery. Slave owners from the south believed it was acceptable to use humans as some free farm devices as well as punish and own them, which was severely opposed by people from the north. This ultimately divided the country into two camps, and when the war broke out, thousands of northern African Americans began to join the army that would break the shackles of their southern brothers. Just imagine how surprised and shocked they had become when, on the battlefield, they encountered the same blacks Union had meant to liberate, but only in the ranks of the Confederate Army as soldiers fighting against them. This phenomenon is referred to as Black Confederates. Even though no one knows for certain, the number of slaves who fought and labored for the South was small. Among the hundreds of thousands of whites who served, there were more than 3,000, but fewer than 10,000 blacks who fought for the Confederacy. Black laborers for the cause numbered from 20,000 to 50,000. The rebel government's use of black labor followed antebellum trends when county administrations commonly hired black workers to help maintain local roads and other public property. Although both groups may be referred to as black confederates, there is a major difference between laborers and soldiers. While huge numbers of black men accompanied every confederate army on the march or in camp, they would not be counted as soldiers. When 89% of eligible white men fought in confederate armies, enslaved and free black people worked much more hours on Virginia farms than usual. Enslaved males were occasionally put into service to build confederate fortifications, send messages to soldiers' families, and practice foraging, while women were made to work as laundresses or cooks for troops in the field. Free black people frequently labored alongside the enslaved for low salaries, at least because they were afraid of losing their freedom if they did not contribute to the war effort. Many enslaved black men worked at Richmond's Tredegar Ironworks, which produced half of Confederate cannon. As teamsters unloading trains, dock workers unloading ships, miners and road maintenance crews. When a slaveholding family's son or sons enrolled, they would often bring a family slave to work as a personal servant. Such slaves would be assigned non-combat tasks, such as transporting and loading supplies. Uncle Jefferson Shields was born into slavery in Virginia and served as a servant for Confederate judge, businessman, and politician James Kerr Edmondson, a colonel in the 27th Virginia Infantry Regiment during the Civil War. Confederate leaders frequently brought slaves with them as servants, and Shields was one of several former camp slaves and foragers who later embraced this position, creating extravagant personality. White Southerners developed the illusion of a beneficial slave-holding South populated with faithful black Confederates by giving men like Shields the privilege of donning the gray uniform, as well as the ever-increasing set of medals pins and ribbons visible in his photos. Confederate troops were understandably concerned about having too many blacks marching with them, as their patchy obedience to the Confederacy meant that the possibility of one running away and alerting the Federals about the rebel army's number and position was high. Opposition to arming blacks was considerably stronger. Many Southerners already feared slave revolts, and arming blacks would increase the possibility of mistreated slaves overthrowing their masters. Slave owners believed that these men would remain deeply loyal even in the face of opportunity to flee, but this belief would be tested during the Gettysburg Campaign. On July 2nd, while tending to injured Confederates, Matt Butler, assistant surgeon of the 37th Virginia, had a horse shot out from underneath him and was wounded in the foot. He was able to limp off the field, thanks to the assistance of a camp servant named Jim. Just as the firing ended late on July 2nd, Confederate artillerist Edward Porter Alexander was pleasantly surprised to see his servant Charlie on my spare horse Meg and with very affectionate greetings and a good haversack of rations. Negro servants hunting for their masters were a feature of the landscape that night. 
The Army of Northern Virginia's ability to successfully cross the Potomac with the Union Army in pursuit was heavily dependent on camp slaves who cared for their wounded masters, as well as the vast numbers of enslaved workers assigned to trains, wagons, and ambulances that stretched for miles. Captain William McLeod of the 38th Georgia died before the retreat, but an enslaved worker called Moses organized for his burial on a nearby farm. Moses then accompanied a Confederate brigade back to Winchester, Virginia, before returning to Swainsboro, Georgia with his owner's personal things. In 1865, Moses traveled back to Gettysburg with McLeod's brother-in-law to retrieve the remains. Other camp slaves and enslaved men abandoned their posts right after the battle and throughout the Confederate Army's retreat to Virginia. A quartermaster in John Bell Hood's division reported that a great many Negroes have gone to the Yankees. The drained Confederates were hampered in their retreat by Union cavalry raids, like the one led by Judson Kilpatrick at Monterey Pass on July 5th. As a result, more prisoners were taken. Some of these men were briefly incarcerated in Union prison camps. Once released, many joined Union armies or traveled to towns and cities throughout the North in search of work. As the Confederate Army regrouped in the weeks following the campaign, the lack of enslaved soldiers worsened the weak ranks of many battalions. Gettysburg campaign did indicate a crisis of trust in soldiers' faith in their slaves' everlasting loyalty. Confederate Congress's reaction to the Union Army's decision to put black men in uniform was straight horror and disgust. Even though in the last weeks of the war, they implemented the same thing. After President Abraham Lincoln signed the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in September 1862, the United States started to actively recruit black males for military service. In the eyes of white Southerners, those black soldiers were rebellious enslaved workers, and their white leaders were responsible for causing slave mutiny. Both may be punished under Southern state laws, and Confederate President Jefferson Davis directed that all black men caught in Union uniforms be executed or re-enslaved. Near the end of the war, the use of black soldiers was discussed once again. In 1864, General Patrick Cleburne proposed recruiting Negro slaves in the army. The concept was considered, but at least one Southern official asked, what did we go to war for if not to protect our property? Another member of the audience stated, if slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. General Robert E. Lee knew he lacked soldiers. He went on to say, we must decide whether slavery shall be abolished by our enemies and the slaves be used against us or use them ourselves. Lee proposed that slaves be liberated in exchange for their duty as troops. However, that requirement was not included in the law passed by the Confederate Congress on March 13, 1865. Only a few thousand black people enrolled before the war ended. Two companies were formed from laborers at two local hospitals, Winder and Jackson, as well as an official recruitment facility set up by General Ewell and staffed by Majors James Pegram and Thomas Turner. Overall, they were able to attract approximately 200 men. They marched through the streets of Richmond, yet without guns. At least one such parade had to be canceled due to a lack of not only weapons, but also clothes and equipment. This doesn't mean that no black guy ever fired a gun for the Confederacy. Some Union reports reveal black soldiers shooting at Union soldiers. One refers to capturing a small group of armed black men together with some soldiers, and the others mention unarmed black laborers. An unidentified African-American fighting for the Confederacy is described in two Southern 1862 newspapers as a huge Negro fighting under Confederate Major General John Breckinridge's command against the 14th Maine Infantry Regiment on August 5, 1862, near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The man was said to be armed and equipped with knapsack, musket, and uniform, and was assisting to lead the attack. The man's status as a freedman or a slave remains unknown. 
There is no record of Union soldiers coming across an all black line of battle or anything close to it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and press likes.